All right. Well, thank you everyone for being here. Welcome to Little Saigon. We can do it louder than that. One more time. Welcome to Little Saigon. That's more like it. Xin chào quý vị. Welcome community members, distinguished guests, esteemed entrepreneurs. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for our When Genesis Talks Power Series Talks. Yeah. This is brought to you by the Genesis Bank Institute for Entrepreneurship and this business advisory and incubator division of Genesis Bank. This panel today will explore the history and future of entrepreneurship in the beauty industry. My name is Tam Nguyen, and in Vietnamese, I'm also known as Tham Nguyen. I am excited to co-host this powerhouse series at Advanced Beauty College. This is a community conversation and an engagement platform that will provide us direct financial literacy, business education to our Southern California greater community. Our clients of Genesis Bank and members of the Genesis Bank Institute for Entrepreneurship, which is also known as the acronym GBIE, along with our strategic partners, our community partners, corporate partners, are all coming together today to learn from a variety of diverse and successful entrepreneurs, community leaders, and business owners here in Southern California, and in particular here in Little Saigon, Orange County. The Genesis Bank Institute for Entrepreneurship has been created to connect, develop relationships, and provide business advisory to support and help our to help accelerate our the success of our small to mid-sized family-owned business businesses, much like our family-owned business here at Advanced Beauty College, which is in its second generation. Our mission is to democratize business and financial education by breaking down the impediments that inhibit access to our economic growth opportunities. I'd like at this time to acknowledge some special guests in the audience today. First and foremost, I want to acknowledge our council member Stephanie Klovinsky. Yes. Stephanie? Thank you for being here and representing the mayor of the city of Garden Grove. We will also be having other members of her city council <laughs> throughout the program. Next, our neighboring city, the city of Westminster, we have our councilwoman Amy Fan West. Amy? Yeah, Amy, thank you, Amy, for being here representing the city of Westminster. And some of her colleagues may be coming later in the program. I also will have other school board members and other elected officials coming throughout the program today, as well as representatives from their office. In the community, we also have a number of uh, other distinguished guests. Uh, my alma mater, Cal State Fullerton, our, our, our president and her lady, Fran and Julie Virtue here. Where's Fran and Julie? Yes. Do we have any other Titans in the audience? Any other Cal State Fullerton Titans? Yes. I hear you, I see you, fellow Titans. We also have um, other um, Cal State Fullerton dignitaries coming in later in the program that will include our Dean of Business, uh, Sri Sundaram, our Dean of Extension International Programs, Deborah Leahy, as well as um, our, uh, our professors as well, who will be joining us later in the program. We also have UCI representing UCI, our favorite professor, Dr. Fu Nguyen, representing UCI. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nguyen, for, for joining us today. Our favorite hospitals from Orange County are also represented in the program today. Uh, Memorial Care Hospital executives, uh, both from Orange Coast Medical Center and from Saddleback Medical Center. Let's give it up for Greg Muniz and Christy Ward. Greg, Christy, where are you? Yeah, I see you, Greg. I see you, Christy. There are other dignitaries, other community VIP leaders. I want to give shout outs to so many ethnic chambers that are here. I know our Hispanic Chamber of Commerce leaders are here, Mitch and some of your board members. I know our Black Chamber of Commerce will be joining us later in the program today. The SBDN, um, uh, Small Business Diversity Network, Jay, Alex, and the crew are coming. Uh, we have the Vietnamese American Chamber of Commerce Chair, uh, Chairman Tan Pham, who, who, who is joining us today. Um, so many others. Um, so, all, all, so please network and meet all the all the leaders. There's so many distinguished guests and leaders throughout the community that will be joining us today. 
Lastly, but not least, I have the honor of introducing Stephen Gordon. Stephen H. Gordon, the founding chairman and CEO of Genesis Bank. He's had nearly 40 years of financial industry experience, including serving as founding chairman, CEO, and president of Opus Bank. He's also the founding chairman and CEO of Commercial Capital Bank, its holding company, Commercial Capital Bank Corp, as well as chairman and CEO of Fremont Investment and Loan, its holding company, Fremont General Corporation. Additionally, he served as partner of Sandler O'Neill and Partners, New York-based investment banking funder, fund, firm, uh, now Piper Sandler. I, I just want to say, on a very personal note, he's become a brother to me. And uh, he spent so much time with my wife and I in the community, in Little Saigon. He even goes to eat at Vietnamese restaurants without me now. <laughs> and uh, and Stephen, uh, Stephen's amazing. Over, uh, I love the community. I love networking. And in the community, I've learned from so many um, entrepreneurs and business people. In my career, I've seen people flip and sell businesses. I've seen them flip and sell properties. But never in my life until now had I met someone in the banking industry who buys and sells banks, uh, starting with the millions and then going into the billion. Very impressive. So without further ado, welcome to Little Soul Saigon. Welcome to Advanced Media College. Let's give it up for Stephen Gordon. Thank you. So, so just to set the record straight, uh, we, my wife and I and Tim and his wife, we went out for dinner. And, uh, and the owner of the restaurant, this is a Vietnamese restaurant, the owner of the restaurant came up to us and then they, they asked uh, to Tim, you selected the restaurant. I'm so glad you came here. And he looked at the owner and said, no, actually, Stephen selected the restaurant. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you, Tim. And, and I very much view you as a brother. You know, we, we came together when, when Genesis was just an idea. And we were talking about how to have a major impact in our communities, how to make a difference in our communities. How to, how to really address our minority communities and, uh, and have an impact. And, and Tam, amazingly, little did I know that he's on 20 boards, <laughs> but, but Tam said that he would be honored to join the board of Genesis Bank and that it was actually extremely important to the community that he join the bank and set an example of what one can do and 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 work their way as a second generation uh, immigrant here in Orange County, here in California, in the United States, and, and and actually get to the point where you're on the board of directors of the bank. And from a leadership standpoint, that every single day I learn from Tam, share with Tam, and been inspired by Tam, and, um, and you really make the journey of impacting our communities truly enjoyable. Otherwise, um, you and I would just be hanging out at restaurants. So, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us as one of two, only two, diverse multiracial minority depository institutions in the United States. Genesis Bank considers our experiential events like today to be an invaluable way that we can support businesses and entrepreneurs within our community. We believe that storytelling is a powerful tool to connect, relate, teach, and inspire. We thank you for being a part of this commitment to community and in education. We thank you so much for being here today and being a part of this. Because of Tam and his deep family root, or his family's deep rooted experience and expertise within the beauty and nail industry, this past April, Genesis Bank organized the Beauty Industry Professional Advisors, or BIPA, a team of leading professional business advisors focused on providing a comprehensive support for businesses in the nail beauty related industries. As founding members of this professional network, Genesis Bank and the GBIE, or Genesis Bank Institute for Entrepreneurship, are committed to fulfilling our role for clients by bringing together the most critically important financial, educational, technical, and professional advisory firms to serve the needs of businesses in the nail and beauty sectors, many of whom are minority and family owned and operated. Tam, Belay, Derek are also members, along with seven, several other professionals that are here today. This, there's a table in the back if you'd like to learn more about, uh, about BIPA and there's information to be provided. We, we really felt it was important that in looking at small, to mid-sized, family-owned, minority-owned businesses, 
Is it one can have an amazing idea and want to execute on that idea, on that dream, that vision. And, and what sometimes gets in the way of executing on that dream and actually turning that into a great success is just education and knowledge in all sorts of other areas of expertise that perhaps the business owner doesn't have. So we brought together leaders, professionals, successful um, uh, recording uh, professionals <laughs> from <laughs> the legal <laughs> profession, the <laughs> risk management, insurance, <laughs> to uh, educational, <laughs> to, uh, 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 educational, for example, you have Tam and his family's business, and, and everybody comes together, including from our standpoint, the banking side, and we create almost like a one-stop shop. Uh, brain power and knowledge experience that enables a business to succeed and grow and be there as mentors, advisors, providers of technical assistance, etc. So we believe that our relationship with the community is the core of everything we do. This is why we built the Genesis Bank Institute for Entrepreneurship as a division within Genesis Bank and as to create and nourish relationships with small businesses and diverse individuals in our communities, providing them with resources and relationships to the GBIE's mission is to democratize business and financial education by breaking down the barriers that have inhibited access to financial, educational, economic, and socioeconomic growth opportunities. I'm excited to tell you about one of our newest initiatives to carry out this mission, which is our completely free, you heard that free, right? Uh, financial education app powered by Zoga. Z O G O. So the app is available in both English and Spanish and will be available in other languages in the future and provides bite-sized financial literacy lessons on intelligently saving, spending, and managing your money. Users are incentivized to learn or to earn while they learn with real-life rewards and gift cards to popular retailers. This partnership offers an essential blend of tangible and technological innovation that for many years has been left out of banking and education industries. I encourage each and every one of you to open your phones, go to the App Store or Google Play Store, and download Zogo. For more information on Zogo, our other programs, and how to become a member of the Genesis Bank Institute for Entrepreneurship, please see the BIPA table in the back. Next, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the Alzheimer's Association of Orange County for being here today, specifically Emily Cameron and Paul Wong from their team. For those of you who haven't heard, I have the honor of serving, serving as the chair of the Executive Walk Committee for the Orange County Walk to End Alzheimer's on Saturday, October 21st in Irvine. It's important to note that minority populations are historically underrepresented in clinical trials that support the essential research, treatment, and medication of Alzheimer's disease, and minority communities are affected one and a half to two times as much as non-minority communities. As a, as a community and driven, mission driven minority depository institution, Genesis Bank is committed to promoting awareness of Alzheimer's across its diverse communities. If you have more questions or want to learn more about how to support the fight to end Alzheimer's, please visit the table in the back. I'd also like to thank the sponsors of today's event, our host, Advanced Beauty College, Well Spa. Where's the team from Well Spa? There they are. There you are. Seven Leaves Cafe. Are we out of tea or is there one more, two more? Two more. Two more. Two more. Two more. And Slick Marketers, we're the, we're the Slick Marketers team. You all contributed to the success of today and we appreciate your partnership. Lastly, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this afternoon's panel, Derek Nguyen. Derek is an attorney here in Orange County and represents many small businesses, including nail salons. Derek was a past president of the Vietnamese American Bar Association of Southern California, and he serves as an advisor to the Vietnamese American Chamber of Commerce in Orange County and the College of Humanity and Social Science at Cal State Fullerton. In 2004, Derek was appointed by President George W. Bush to the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Please welcome Derek. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, I'm so excited about this program. I'm sure that we can all learn a lot. And I'm also honored to be moderating 
uh, the program, sitting at the same table with this distinguished panelist. But before we start, I believe Tom has some uh, more acknowledgement to make. Yes, thank you, and Derek. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge a few other guests that I've noticed in the audience who've come. Uh, first and foremost, other education leaders. We have our um, Golden West College Vice President, Dr. Kay Nguyen, <laughs> along with Dom from her team. Uh, we also have the Highlands team here. Uh, I see Ian Basto and Sheila Tao. Are they effective? Yes. Yay! Thank you for providing the English instruction for all, all of our uh, nail and beauty uh, professionals. I also want to acknowledge the media. We have media here. Although we have 300 guests here today, uh, the media has come here. First and foremost, SBTN and Fandanam. Thank you, SBTN, TV station, for being here. I also want to acknowledge the radio, Daimak Vietnam, Go Nhu Hao. Please, Go Nhu Hao. Thank you. And of course, Go Kyu Mi, you and Anne Nguyen uh, from uh, the media. Media, media, media. Uh, we will also have an additional media and radio and, and, uh, that will be coming throughout the event. Last but not least, thank you, Genesis Bank, for hosting this, the team, Advanced Beauty College team, who's been here since 7 a.m. and spent the last few months preparing this. And then, of course, of course, my family. Uh, I see in the audience, Mom, uh, Lynn, uh, for you. And, uh, and, and, uh, and a very, very, very special guest is my mom's uh, high school friend. She is uh, Go Thuan Le and her daughter, Van. Go Thuan happens to be the first ever Vietnamese manicurist, the first 20 part of Tippi Hedren's group, the historic group in 1975. Thank you, Go Thuan, for being here to represent the industry. All right, back to you, and Derek. Oh, last, I see Nailing It, too. Okay, I gotta give a shout out for the Nailing It for America. I see I'm Ted, I'm Johnny, Christy, and the, and the group. So thank you, Nailing It for America, for being here as well. All right, now on to our panel. We have a very diverse panel of esteemed executives and innovators in the beauty industry who will share their insights on the history and future of entrepreneurship within the beauty industry. Business trends shaping the industry today, perspectives on the genesis and evolution of entrepreneurship, challenges that our diverse entrepreneurs face within the industry, and how our minority communities play a crucial role in the industry's advancement. So please help me in welcoming Jen Chung, founder of Embody. Jen Chung represents the second generation of leadership at Forever View More a 17 years old family founded enterprise and is also the founder of Ann Buddy, a revolutionary ingestible skin care company. Ann Buddy's mission is to promote a holistic and healthy approach to skin care by bridging the gap between topical applications and internal nourishment. Both Forever Billmore and Embody stand as a testament to Jennifer's commitment to empowering women in their skincare journey, helping them to embrace and celebrate their skin. Jennifer is eager to share her experience with the beauty industry and hopes to inspire the audience here today to consider a fulfilling career in entrepreneurship within the beauty sector. Next to my left, my dear friend Billy Nguyen, owner and agent, State Farm Insurance Agency. With over 20 years of insurance industry experience, Billy has a strong foundation in working closely with businesses to establish the right coverage for their needs. Her office works with individuals and businesses throughout Orange County and has been recognized by State Farm for the commitment to quality and performance with the Chairman's Circle Award. Billy starts every client partnership by having real conversations and believes this is the key to building relationships You're in that a make a difference. Billy and her family team have extensive experience in the nail and beauty industry and make sure they have their clients throughout the entire insurance journey for their businesses. And finally, Tam Nguyen, founder and chair of Advanced Beauty College. Pam has 25 years of experience as a business, community, education, and philanthropic leader. Pam's a second generation family business owner of Advanced Beauty College, a multiple campuses in Southern California, graduating about 50,000 beauty professionals 
over its 35 years history. The nail salon training program based right here in Little Saigon is an established leader and one of the largest in the country. He served two terms on the National Board of Directors for the American Association of Cosmetology Schools. As a proud founding board member for Genesis Bank, TAM provides leadership and governance while serving as the bridge to our local communities. And of course, Stephen Borden, founding chairman and CEO of Genesis Bank. All right, let's start our program with our first question. Um, as I travel around the country speaking with small businesses, uh, the first question is, where do we get the money? In Vietnamese, we have to tok đầu tiên, tiền đầu, right? So let's start with our money man. Stephen, what are some of the myths within the nail and beauty industry when it comes to banking? And how can you myth bust them? Well, you, you phrased it very interestingly because you said, where do you get the money? It's, it, it seems obvious the money's at the bank. Yes. Right? And, but, but having access to the banking system is not always equal for everybody. Uh, you have, it, and we've seen, all of a sudden we've learned a lot in the last few months about startup businesses, early stage businesses, uh, and, and some of those are challenges for banks the banking system because the banking system is regulated and has a whole lot of rules around it and a lot of bureaucracy around it. Uh, what, what we often find when you start looking specifically inside of the beauty industry, nail industry, is that you know, when, when we start talking about some of the myths of the industry and what sometimes creates a little bit of a, uh, a barrier to businesses within the industry having access to banking, is, is it goes back to again, the education around keeping good books and records, being able to show solid financials, being able to uh, show where the business is going to go and then have a lot of transparency. And, and, and to put it, put it really directly, you know, I think some of the challenges traditionally around the industry is what's actually reported versus not reported. And then from a legal standpoint, an employment standpoint, the treatment of someone as an employee versus an independent contractor and where that works its way somehow into the financials. And, uh, and we've figured out at Genesis how to be able to focus on the industry, have a lot of knowledge around the industry internally, to specialize within the industry, and to be able to bank the industry in a couple of different ways. One is from the cash management standpoint and also the merchant processing standpoint. And we have partnerships both on our balance sheet of the bank as well as off the balance sheet of the bank that enables us to be able to bring the attention and care to clients within the industry and give them access to a bank. And then from a lending standpoint, I think Andrew Moore is somewhere around here. He's uh, business banking and government programs and other programs within Genesis Bank, but also outside of Genesis Bank. And we've already financed a few nail salons with their equipment acquisitions, with the ability to uh, buy chairs and other equipment within the salons, and to be able to actually expand it. So we do do this, but. But it's a challenge for the industry overall, nor are there any banks that I know of, or Tam that you know of, that focus specifically, or have a specific focus within this sector. Great, thank you. Speaking of regulations, and, and uh, interestingly, Sitten mentioned the employees uh, versus the independent contractor status. Billy, uh, what kind of insurance needs uh, that a, uh, a person who starts a business uh, should be aware of. Yeah. Um, so something that Stephen had already mentioned and also and Derek too is when you're opening a business and you're uh, in the beauty industry sometimes it's more about how you want to classify your employees or the independent contractor that then when it comes to me as the insurance agent I have to do my due diligence to make sure that I'm insuring um, your salon properly 
and also all the employees. So, for example, when I have a salon owner who comes to me and they say, well, I don't need workers' comp because I have independent contractors. And my response would always be, your name is on this business here. And when your quote-unquote independent contractor comes to work for you, are they truly independent? Or in the letter of the law, that they are actually your employee um, when you have hours for them to come or when they share in your supplies, like little nuances like that. So if you do have truly an independent contractor by law, then I would suggest insurance purposes, they own their own business technically. So if they're renting a station uh, at your salon, then you do want them to have their own general liability, um, their own you know, workers' comp, just as if they are their own business. So just um, uh, to just be cautious about how you want to classify for tax purposes versus truly wanting to protect your business from having a lawsuit come to you. How? Maybe you just gave us some information on regulations concerning insurance. Uh, my next question is for Jan. Good respect to the products especially the supplements, uh, are there any regulations that we should be concerned about? So, the good and bad news is that the FDA um, doesn't really regulate cosmetics and supplements. They regulate it to a degree, um, but a lot of businesses are relying on the manufacturers to be the ones in compliance. So for us, when we are manufacturing skincare or manufacturing supplements, we really try to be uh, compliant. These products are products that we are using. These are products that our uh, customers are using. So we do two things. One, we make sure that we work with manufacturers who are compliant. So whether that's GMP certified, ISO certified, um, and these are certificates that any manufacturer you work with should be able to provide. Um, and then beyond that, we work with uh, third-party FDA compliance um, agencies. So when we are, let's say, creating a supplement, we'll actually send all the labels, send all the ingredients, and send our products to these agencies to then um, conduct their testing. And that gives us the, um, I guess, a, a satisfaction that these products are going to not face any regulatory issues when we go into market. So supplements are, are a new thing uh, in the beauty industry, so to speak. Uh, Tam, uh, what has the beauty industry uh, evolved? Uh, could you share us with the history? Yeah, thank you. Um, real quick, I, I, I just want to shout out, I see Linda from Asian Business Association, Anton from uh, Asian American National Committee, and, and others. So, And of course, Lisa Ann Moles uh, filming in, coming in from AP Nailcon and, and the team there. Thank you, Lisa. But um, the evolution we've seen in the beauty industry over the last 46 years, uh, my parents were salon owners for the first 10 years, and, and then of course the beauty colleges uh, were launched 36 years ago. My parents owned and operated for the first 12 years, and then Lynn and I ever since. What we've seen uh, in our industry was the beauty industry has always been what I call a high-touch, low-tech industry uh, because of the nature of our, our, our industry. Well, we saw that reverse. We saw that flip. Uh, technology has now been part of every industry and even the beauty industry. Uh, for the first time in our industry history, beauty colleges around the country, including ours, during the pandemic went virtual. And, and now it's a, it's a permanent thing. So not only have we gone uh, permanently virtual in having the hybrid learning set up, that's also uh, infiltrated into the, uh, the, the, the industry uh, in terms of the employment side. Uh, another thing that we've seen in terms of our graduates is the, the brick and mortar model only is gone. They've become more mobile. So, for example, today we have Sola Salon Suites, a very recognizable brand, brand employer, a leader in the industry. Many of our Many of our graduates now in beauty professionals are so entrepreneurial that they are able to set up their own book of clients and go into a solo suite immediately when they book of clients. 
bypassing this whole barrier of setting up the brick and mortar salon, which used to be uh, which used to be a, a quite an investment. So we're just going more mobile, we're going more technology, and, and we're seeing not just being in a high touch industry anymore, but we're, we're going high tech as well. Well, with uh, that trend, uh, I suppose they would need a lot of finances. So, uh, Stephen, uh, how could a, a new business owner obtain financial assistance? How could a good banker help? So you're talking about a startup new business owner, someone, for example, who just graduated yes. from Advanced Business College Correct. and now wants to go out and open a salon or open their own personal business in one way or another. Uh, okay, so so I, I tried to introduce Andrew Mort. I don't see Andrew anywhere. Yes, no. There he is in the back. So anybody who's looking to start up a new business should speak with Andrew Mort at Genesis Bank. And uh, there are various programs that are available to be able to support that. Uh, and, and then th there are two different ways I kind of view it. There are businesses that need financing, don't need financing. But then a business that's generating cash flow still needs a bank and needs access to the banking system in order to have somewhere to be able to safely keep their their revenues, their earnings. And, um, and it's kind of, kind of goes back to when we were having that earlier part of the discussion, the first question I think it was, you kind of have to pick your poison. You got to decide, do you want access to the banking system or do you not? Because if you, if you don't want access to the banking system, then yeah. you're financing yourself with, with non-bank bank-like financing who generally charges significantly higher rates and gouges the borrower, or you're using credit cards to finance your business, and that means you're financing yourself in the north of 20% type of rates. And, um, but if you want access to the banking system, then you just need to be able to comply with what it takes to be able to access the banking system. Like, Malay, what you were saying about running your business in a certain way, you know, reporting tax-wise in a certain manner, running your books appropriately, and having proper risk management around that business. So the, 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 the startups are a little bit tougher than an already ongoing, uh, uh, more mature type business, but, but the banking system and through Genesis, we, we, can, be able, we can support those activities. Thanks, Stephen. Um, uh, the next question is for you, Jen. After you get financing, of course, you want to promote your products. How do you do that effectively? Is it just through ads, or through education, or through promotions? I think it's all of those things. And when people think of marketing, they think that it is going to be ridiculously expensive, right? You have PR, you have digital ads, you have influencers nowadays. And yes, all those things are expensive and all those things might be necessary in your growth. But we have the power of social media at our hands now. And I think that's something that my generation and the younger generations have really benefited when it comes to marketing our business. Right now, I am on TikTok all the time. I say it's for personal research, but TikTok, there are so many brands who have been able to use that platform in a free way to share their message, share their purpose, share their products, um, and it's able to reach such a large audience. So if you are to start your brand now, I would say, once you really understand your why, why you're doing what you're doing, how are your products helping people, use platforms like social media, Instagram, TikTok, to really spread that message um, instead of focusing on things that require a lot of financing um, right up front. But should you do that uh, at the very early stage of the business, or you should uh, get some sort of... Uh, <laughs> A comfort zone, you know, comfort zone first. You know, people love the storytelling aspect, especially on TikTok. So when you, even before you start your business, I have seen um, brands that even before they have their product are going on TikTok, for example, 
to share their story behind the scenes. I myself, as a consumer, love seeing that from a brand. And it can be intimidating, but just like everything else that you do, it's truly a power, a, a muscle that you grow over time. And you might not realize that your content to you might be boring. Like for me, I, the behind the scenes of my business is very boring and I sometimes hate it. But when I record it and I share it with people, they absolutely love it and it makes them connected to your brand and want to advocate for your brand more. And I think in a market nowadays where there's so many brands popping up daily, what sets you apart? And that's your power to storytell. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Uh, um, uh, over 35 years with 50,000 graduates, you must have seen a lot of uh, success stories and also failure stories. Uh, in your experience, uh, what would be the biggest challenges that um, a, uh, an entrepreneur face when they try to open the business? Yeah. Um, so we've seen a lot over the cycles, over the decades. And, and we get together a lot with our, our employers. So twice a year, we bring our employers uh, from from one-off uh, salon owners to chains, like Kimberly's here later today, who owns Happy Nails, over 50 locations in Southern California. And, and, the, and the story's always the same. The biggest challenge in our nail and beauty industry still is the people. So, you know, so they're always sharing with Lynn and I, we need your graduates, not just now, but we need them yesterday. Um, a lot of times, um, these owners who go into the industry end up working much more than they, they, they sign up for only because it's so hard to keep a good person. Uh, that challenge still exists today. Many salon owners still share with Lynn and I on a regular basis that it's hard to keep a loyal person, it's hard to keep a licensed manicurist, a hairdresser, barber, etc. So, so the people aspect is still um, right alongside with the capital aspect in terms of finding the capital. So I would say the two capitals is the financial capital and the human capital. But the nail industry is very much uh, ethnic. Uh, Stephen, do you, uh, you have any part in uh, the nail and beauty industry, so specifically design for this Vietnamese and American community, and how can a bank help them propel their business further? So when, um, when Tam and I first came together, we started talking about Tam joining the board of Genesis Bank. Tim, Tim and I discussed it right like this was this was just coming out of COVID, somewhat in the midst of COVID. And, and it seems like every single time there's a challenge economically as a result of something uh, that family owned businesses, small businesses are left behind, and that minority owned businesses are left even further behind. And then Tim went on to educate me that that there are approximately 11,000 salons, dental salons, in Southern California, that Orange County have, has the largest Vietnamese population in the world outside of Vietnam. And, um, and we started talking about, at some point, bringing the bank and education and Danny Fagan, who's here somewhere, she runs the Genesis Bank Institute for Entrepreneurship, and and being able to bring all these different skill sets to the salon industry that to break down the barriers and to make it so that the next time an economic cycle hits, that these businesses are not left behind. And here we are, heading into an economic cycle, heading into a recession, and um, and we're committed to the industry and to being there to, you know, to back the industry. So I think that, that recognizing how deep and broad the market is it just represents an enormous need to have access to banking traditionally what the more we discuss this with clients the more we discuss it to him and i traditionally what a salon owner does is they go into one of the large banks that has a branch on the street here and they walk into a b of a or they walk into a wells or into a chase branch and they get exactly that a branch employee they get a teller and the teller is generally the lowest paid lowest skilled person inside the entire banking organization and that's the skill set that the owner of the salon actually has access to 
And something about that sounds very, very wrong. Someone's trying to run a business and they're going into a bank and they walk into a branch because they think that's what banking is, the building that they see across the street. And and they don't get access to to the the brain power, to the decision makers. They don't get access to those who are highly educated with dealing with the growth of a business and how to be able to support that growth. So we've really tried to break down that barrier. We don't have branches other than the headquarters location. And if somebody wants access to Stephen Gordon, they get access to Stephen Gordon. And they know Tam more than they know me, so they generally reach out to Tam, and then Tam reaches out to me, and the meeting is set up. And and I like to say, I've got Tam's cell phone, he's got mine. And uh, and we, we those decisions are made, and you get access to the high-quality banker very easily, very you know, quickly when the need is there. Now, you and Tam are becoming uh, blood brothers now. So. Yes. <laughs> uh, speaking of brothers, most of these uh, salons and businesses uh, in the industry are family oriented. Uh, ABC has been around for 25 years, and, and Tam, you're the second generation owner. Uh, do you see uh, the trend continues to have the salons being operated by families members? Yes. Uh, in fact, the majority of the salon owners that we see and interact with are almost 100% family. Uh, whether it's a, a husband and wife, uh, whether it's a, a son or a daughter joining, uh, whether it's uh, multiple aunts and uncles, uh, there's always a family story uh, as part of it. And if they're not blood related, it's sure they, it's still like a family. Uh, so, so m much, much of the creatives, much of the nail beauty uh, salons that are operating within our space, the service oriented space, are very family oriented to them. Uh, Jet Forever Beauty has been around for 17 years. It's within the family as well. What's the insight? What do you have to share with us as to how to keeping it a family, a successful business? Let me tell you, it is not easy. <laughs> uh, my mom is a very strong-willed woman, and so am I. I'm her daughter, right? That apple doesn't fall, fall far, fall far from the tree. Um, and so it's truly bittersweet. I mean, I get the blessing of being able to work with my mom, but also I'm working with my mom. So there's a lot of challenges that come with that. And luckily for me, my mom has been very open and trusting me with carrying on this next um, generation with the business. Um, my advice for anyone who either wants to pursue their family business because their parents are pressuring them, or if you are a parent who wants to pass on business to the next generation, there needs to be a lot of trust. Um, there needs to be a lot of communication. A little family therapy here and there won't hurt. <laughs> but um, truly, the trust and the communication is such a big part of how I'm able to take forever be born and change it from a family business into the corporation that it is today. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. So, so from the previous generation to running the business, what have you changed about the way the business was run versus how it used to be run? Great question. Um, well, to Bella's point earlier, I added liability insurances. <laughs> I was able to go into the community and work with um, financial professionals, um, uh, insurance professionals, because I knew that if I wanted to bring on high level executives who can help me grow my business and grow the product line, we are going to need those foundations in places. So I highly recommend for you to start with your local SBA to go to networking events like this and just start asking questions. So to answer your question, we started implementing things like workers' comp. We no longer did the 1099 thing. <laughs> we had everyone um, formally on salary. Um, we got, uh, I actually went out and reached out to advisors and have them come in to train me to be a better leader. And I think that's also really important when you're talking about a family business, right? All I've ever known is my family business. And in many ways, that has stunted my growth. And so I had to go out and network and learn myself so I can take all the skills that it needs to be a CEO and bring it back to my family and bring it back to my team. Um, but beyond that, we, um, 
also really changed our marketing, right? The family business has always catered to a very Vietnamese American demographic. And for me to be able to take that mainstream, I had to change the way that we marketed our products um, to appeal to a larger demographic. And that has been a challenge of its own. When I first took over the company, I'm being very transparent here, but I almost ran it to the ground and bless my mom for being able to trust me. That first two years when I took over the family business, we were living day to day on sales because she trusted me a little too much. <laughs> and 25 year old me didn't really know what to do. Um, but part of the family business is figuring out that sweet spot where you honor the past, what has worked, and slowly incorporate the new methods, the new strategies in. Steven, you got to ask her the question. Now I get to ask you the question. Uh, Jennifer mentioned uh, speaking or seeking help from financial advisor. As a banker, do you have any advice for uh, a succession plan for a family-owned business? Well, it, you've got succession planning with it or a need for it within family-owned businesses. I think you have that within any business. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm, so, for example, the reason why I'm saying that is that question hits close to home with me every day. Yeah, I, I, I built banks when I was in my 20s, when I was in my 30s, when I was in my 40s, in my 50s, and now I'm 60. And um, so I'm 59 plus one. And, and, um, and this is the last time I'm going to do it. I've made that promise to my family. And I've already, I, when, when we launched Genesis, I made that promise to the team. And every single day, I feel like part of my job is to make sure that at some point, when I decide I'm done doing it, you know, that, that I've got the person in place who can actually step into my, my chair and have it run extremely well going forward. So part of my responsibility every day is succession planning. And um, I don't want the board of directors to get too active on that because you know they may have a different timeline than I do. But uh, you know every day I'm pulling the team in, the executive team into whatever I'm doing and involving them in decisions that are being made and why I'm making those decisions and why strategically we're going in a certain direction. And they're hearing calls and involved in meetings that they never would have been involved in any other way. It's the same way that you were told when you were, or as you said, when you were younger in the business, that maybe you were given too much latitude, so, you know, the rope was a little too long and you almost hung yourself. And, but, but you were exposed to the running of the business early on, and that put you in a position to do what you do now. So the family thought about that, and, and they looked around, and, and you were the logical person, or maybe you raised your hand and said, I want to run this business, you know, like, no. Right. Well, you know, so, yeah, so but succession planning is very important in a family-run business, and, and sometimes there's a disconnect. Sometimes the previous generation wants the you know, the family member to come into the business and run the business, and that family member wants nothing to do with the business. And, and, and But the dream of building that business and have it operate into perpetuity when that next generation doesn't want to run it, that must be a very challenging, potentially a very sad moment for the the founder of the business, that previous generation. Yeah, and, and it's and critically important. I would love to add on to that, that yes, in the beginning when my mom had handed me the family business, I'm the oldest daughter in an immigrant family, so you can imagine the pressure. I'm sure a lot of you can relate. Um, but I, I felt like I had no other choice. And luckily for me, this was a career path I ended up really, really enjoying. But it's in beauty. I can relate to that. So imagine if my parents had been in an industry like, um, uh, I don't know, manufacturing or plumbing. That wouldn't have fascinated me as much. And that, that's why I want to share with the parents here today that are thinking about passing on their family business. Sometimes, this, you're right, your children aren't the right ones. Maybe they either don't have the skill set or the passion. And so if you really truly want your business to be a success, you have to be vulnerable and open and let others come in who would really help your business thrive in the way that you want it to. Billy, Jennifer also mentioned the need to consult with a with an insurance expert to planning. What are your thoughts? 
so when we're working with insurance and making sure, for example, if a business owner has a partner or these days lots of partners, right? And what they don't think about while they're busy running their business is what happens if one of the owners becomes disabled or what if one of the owners passes away. And so one of the way that business owners can utilize insurance is to make sure, of course, to have the disability insurance, um, long-term care, and also with the succession is using insurance to be able to, uh, for example, what's called the buy sell agreement, where if one of the owner passes away, then the life insurance proceeds will go to the other family to buy them out so the business continues and i know with salons there are families um, and you think wow your family wouldn't have any conflict if someone were to pass away or can't contribute to the business but it gets quite messy so um, definitely i would suggest just to have everything in writing go to uh, of course a, a lawyer uh, but you can definitely use life insurance to be able to uh, run the business smoothly after an owner is uh, disabled or passes away. Great, thank you. Uh, audience, I may not have asked the questions that you want to ask, so uh, you're welcome. You're welcome to come up. We have a microphone set up right in the front for you to ask your specific questions, so please. Uh, in the meantime, let me turn to Tan. Uh, what are the uh, some of the most exciting new trends in the beauty industry now that you would like to share with us, and and how we can take advantage of them? Lynn is much more hip than me, so she probably knows the trends. Uh, but um, some of the, so maybe Lynn can address it. But the trends that I know of, in tr Lynn, do you want to address it in terms of the trends? Because that's more your side of the house on the business. And Derek asked about some of the trends, upcoming trends in the business. So maybe you could share. Here, you can come up. I do want to correct him, you are pretty hip. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Mike. Mike for that. Lynn is Tom's brother, I mean sister. <laughs> yes. The brother-sister team has been the second generation owner of Advanced Beauty College. Okay. Um, so when we're talking about trends is it um, with business owners, um, a lot of our students um, when they're graduating from school now, um, what we find is that they want to be their own business owners. So a lot of them are already having clients before they even start school on Instagram and they have their clientele that they do nails and they follow them. So it's exciting where they can get through school and they actually have a client base where when they graduate, they can put on Instagram wherever they're going to be, and um, they have their clientele. So that's exciting for the students, but nowadays, you know, the services such as the acrylic nails, the gel nails, um, the eyelash extensions, the brow laminations, those are all extremely popular. The lash lifts are very popular. So those are types of services where you, once you start getting them, you have to maintain them all the time. So. Yeah. Beauty business is once you get into it, then you've got to keep continuing with maintaining the beauty services. So, an exciting time for the beauty industry for sure. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Lynn. And uh, opportunities come with responsibilities. So, Bailey, uh, for for a nail salon to engage the new trends, what are the things that they should be aware of to minimize their loss or litigation claims? Sure. So, um, the student was talking about going to a bank, uh, obviously to get financing to open up your business. Um, there's a lot of expenses that goes into it, um, especially equipment. And when you're doing build out, you know, uh, nail salon owners that we insure, I mean, it, it's about a hundred thousand plus, right, just to open up a nail salon. and. What happens more often is when they do come to me for insurance, they've spent so much money on getting the business already set up that the insurance might not be their priority. And it isn't until, unfortunately, when something does happen where a lawsuit comes or, you know, I've had a nail salon burn down, then we realize that coverage is very, very important. 
So one of the aspects of insurance is that you want to have a professional that asks you the right questions to ensure your risk properly. So when I know someone who wants $25,000 coverage uh, for their business property, um, I just can't in my heart um, be able to like to say, okay, so it's something where it's a fine line between being the professional to ensure them properly and of course working with their budget as well. Uh, there may be something that we should be watching for. I don't know what's the problem or not. But what about nail salon become so successful and they have uh, extra cash? What should they do, Stephen? Extra cash. Enjoy. No. Uh, no um, you know, banks are now playing. They're paying pretty good rates on deposits. Um, yeah, I think that that the returns that one can get just by simply putting money in the bank and having it be safe and secure, you know, I think can often be uh, a wise decision. Uh, Bella just brought up something very interesting, which is, you know, if someone goes the traditional route of not having access, and when I say traditional, meaning within this industry, of not having access to the banking system and reasonably priced financing, and instead turns to their credit cards in order to be able to start their business up. And the cost of financing, and they're not going to be able to get $100,000 access through their credit card. They may have a limit that limits them there, and now they're turning to friends and family and whatever. But the cost of that money is very expensive. And, and now all of a sudden they're in debt. It's almost like having you know, too much in student loans. And how do you get out from under that and then they turn to Bella for, you know, for, for insurance and they can't afford enough insurance because they're not spinning off any cash flow that, that is going to anything other than to pay the debt, and the interest on the debt. So if instead you've got access to the banking system and you're able to finance yourself much more inexpensively, and you can get to that point where you've got the cash flow coming through, you know, then you want to be careful with that. And I've heard people say, Oh, I should go buy real estate, I should go do all sorts of stuff. I think step one, just get yourself a bank account. And you get some money in the bank, give yourself some reserves, give yourself some cushion in case the business hits a hiccup with challenges, and, um, and, and, and then go from there. I just had dinner with some business people yesterday, and uh, they were talking about getting a credit line. They said, for your business, you should get a credit line when you don't need it. Uh, is it a good thing? Well, it's, it's always funny, you know, when you need it, a bank won't give it to you, right? So, so sometimes it makes sense to get it ahead of time, but just make sure. You know, I've also seen a lot of people that are starting a small business and they get themselves in trouble and they've got too much access to credit and that's not good either. So if you have no access to credit or too much access to credit, and it's an early stage business and you're trying to get it going and trying to manage your way through it, yeah, you've got to be very cautious, but but you know, the, the, that, that credit line, you know, we, we've suddenly hit that environment where things are coming across our mail tables at home again, you know, where you know, it's because of how high rates are on a home loan, you know, and then there's the one you get a second on your home and one you get a credit line and, you know, and, and before you know it, you're deeply in debt. But it depends on the sophistication of the business. It depends on the sophistication of the owner and where it is in its maturity cycle. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? You're welcome to come up. We either have a question or somebody's leaving. <laughs> we have a question. Please. Okay, I have a question. I'm recording because people around the United States want to know what we're doing, AP Nail Pond, Tam, just the whole thing. So they're going to want to know is all of this for Orange County, Southern California, California, is this available to nail techs around the United States? They've already asked me, they've seen some of what we're doing, so now I have to ask you for them because we have nail techs around the world. But we need to talk about the United States, California. They really, really need help. 
You want me to take a crack at it? Please. Okay. So, so uh, brain power, knowledge, experience is not limited to only Orange County or Southern California or California or the Western U.S. I mean, the you know, we can share our knowledge and experience and brain power and mentorship and technical assistance, you know, anywhere in the country. Okay. Um, and then I'll speak specifically to Genesis. If it if it involves bank accounts, deposit accounts, and merchant processing, so that you know the, the person who's paying with a credit card, right, we can do that anywhere in the country. Like as far as loans financing, we do that. For, we do that in Southern California at the moment. Does that help? I believe it will. Yes. I, I guess I, I may jump in a little bit too. As a lawyer, I can tell you that we all know that we have 50 states and the federal government. So we actually have 51 different systems. Uh, but in general, all states' regulations are pretty much the same. There may be one or two technical differences, uh, but in general, we just follow the same rules, principles, so to speak. Um, the, the insurance regulations uh, would be different state by state. Uh, the uh, supplements, it may be governed by uh, the FDA, maybe yes, maybe no, depending on the products. Uh, but uh, I, I think for the different states, uh, we should consult with our own specialists in the state. Yeah, I can speak from the beauty college aspect. We are governed by the state. Uh, the state of California has two boards that oversee our school. And then, of course, our graduates who get licensed. It's a state license. It's good for California. But be above and beyond that, there is reciprocity between the 50 states. So each state has a different regulation as to the number of hours the nail or the barbering or the esthetician course is, etc. And then there's different regulations to make your license more mobile from state to state. Uh, in terms of the brain power that Stephen's sharing, in terms of knowledge, uh, Lynn and I are both very active in the Art Industry Association, which is the acronym AACS. It stands for the American Association of Cosmetology Schools. Uh, I've served on that national board for two terms from 2010 to 2016 and still very active as a member of that organization. So uh, I know, um, and then I'll pass it over to my colleague from the insurance perspective. Go ahead, Lynn. Um, we are regulated, of course, where we're licensed. Um, although uh, I am only licensed here in California, I just want to let everyone know that I get calls from all over the United States. Just questions that I'm able to answer, uh, maybe in general, but I'll also refer them back to whoever is the agent or maybe even a State Farm agent that I know in that state. So. Sorry, you've been waiting. And then I want to clarify one thing. I apologize. I lost during the sentence. Okay. I'll be really quick. So when I said lending only in Southern California, that's if we're doing it on our balance sheet at the bank. If, but we also have banking partners, finance partners all across the country. So if it's something that we're not going to do on our own balance sheet, then we're unlimited in terms of where we can do it. Yes. Hi. So I'm sitting over here and looking at you guys up here from Genesis Bank for all your businesses. I just wanted to thank you for doing this because I think you're all in your own business, but you're in the business of education too. And you're just here out here in the sun educating all of us. So thank you for that. And, you know, I, my, my mom is Tuan Lee, who Tom, Tam mentioned for earlier, was one of the first 20 Vietnamese manicures in the United States. So I grew up in the beauty industry and watching what that looked like, salon to salon. And I'm thinking like what you're trying to do here is really innovate and change the way family businesses do businesses. And a lot of that is changing mindset, um, which can't be easy. So I'm just wondering from each of your perspectives, what's one thing you would ask a family business do to move into a more innovative and um, how, would, how would I say it? An innovative and more successful business in, in the lines of banking, insurance, whatever it might be in your, your, your expertise. Jennifer, you want to take a crack at it? Yes, I would love to add to this. Um, <laughs> I, I think being immigrants, right, we're raised on this mindset of scarcity um, and fear, and a lot of that can 
filter into our business. So when our parents are running these business day to day, it's out of fear, it's out of survival, and there's no room for innovation. There's no room for change. And I think for them to be able to have room for that, it really starts within the family, right? Are we having these difficult conversations within the family? Are we being open to therapy and mental health? Because if we can't change that, then we can't bring in room for other employees to come in for change. We can't bring in room for innovation and regulation to come in. And for my family business, once my mom was able to trust me, build that communication like I mentioned earlier, we were able to put away that fear and instead leave room for opportunity. Yeah, first of all, Van, thank you for the question. Uh, you, you come from an inspiring family, especially your mom being the first of 20 and, and, and the leadership she's taken on that. And, and I've heard your TEDx talk, so pretty awesome. For me, um, there's a massive difference between first generation, second generation, and now third generation mindset. Uh, our mom and dad came from a war. When they came to the U.S. with nothing but the shirts on their back, not only did they come with no money, they came with no language skills, they came with no um, understanding of the American culture and how it's done. So as Lynn and I spent our childhood in their salons and we watched them, and then we think about how we do business now, it is exactly that mindset that Jen alluded to in terms, in terms of the uh, in terms of the mom and dad were like we don't believe we, we don't have trust of the government. There's a scarcity mindset. We're gonna be frugal. We be, we don't believe in debt, and and we're gonna just work hard. And we're gonna put our head down and work hard. Lynn and I, how lucky are we to have access to advisors like on this panel? When our banker is Stephen Gordon, when our insurance professional is Bill Nguyen of State Farm, when our attorney is Derek Nguyen, who was an advisor in the White House, and then on top of that, Lynn and I joined um, our industry organization, which mom and dad, that was a luxury for mom and dad. They never joined it. And then not only did we get a joint, we got active in it. And, and, and then we, got, we had the whole network of the entire country of beauty college owners to learn the ropes. Above and beyond that, Lynn and I have become very active where we went to our, get our business, formal business education at Cal State Fullerton. We've joined our Center for Family Business, uh, and, and we've gone above and beyond that. I'm super excited for the third generation. Uh, Lynn has a daughter now that just started, that, that is a, that's an incoming freshman to, to Cal State Fullerton's business school. I have a daughter in the crowd, Maya, who, who who's... Is she here? She's here. here. Maya, Maya, where are you? Maya, Maya. where are you? Maya, I saw her running around, but Maya is here running around with Michaela. I see her in the audience. Maya was in her yearbook. Yes. She put in her yearbook that she wants to be the next CEO of Genesis Bank. <laughs> How's that? How's that for succession planning? That's true. So, so, so I'm very excited for Maya, my daughter, as well as Lynn's daughters and, and our children, because why? They're doing internships now. Lynn's daughter is taking like leadership, um, organizational leadership at the high school level. Those were definitely luxuries that Lynn and I weren't afforded as we spent our childhood in the salons and just watching mom and dad work. Each generation, the, the tremendous opportunity and growth is huge. And then and then just looking at Genesis Bank creating something special like this, this BIPA acronym of the Beauty Industry Professional Advisors, everyone has access to this group now. So, so it's very exciting in terms of our mindset going from the closed mindset to open mindset, going from the scarcity to the abundant mindset, and going from we're never going to loan, get a loan, but now we're going to get a smart loan or line of credit at the right time. So those are game changers for us. And Elise, do you have anything to share before we take the next question? You have the same question? Yes. Um, so, One second, please. So when you start talking about starting a business, family-owned business, Let's just call it a business and start talking about starting something from an idea on a piece of paper and building it into something. It kind of reminds me of um, when I was young. I was a young investment banker in New York on the 104th floor of Two World Trade. And my greatest mentor in life, who died on 9 11, he, um, you know, I feel like I've never had a job. I've always 
I've always been a partner in a firm or a founder of a firm, a founder of a bank, and 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 I've always had my own capital at risk. So ultimate entrepreneurship. And I remember my mentor, Herman Sandler, saying to me, and I'll never forget this, he always said, dream big, think big, and break through walls. And the breakthrough walls was you can dream big and think big, but then you've got a million things that can get in your way to, to actually accomplishing, executing on that dream, that vision. And, and that's where the real work starts. You know, at the point that someone says, there's no way that you're going to be able to build that business into anything. There's no way that you know, as you take it over in the second generation and the third generation that you're going to be able to replicate or, or even exponentially build beyond what the original generation did. And, and that's the moment where it's really about you know, you know, really going and making something happen and never let anything get in your way. Thank you. Billy? So uh, on the uh, insurance aspect of it, when it comes to me working with family-owned businesses, um, one of the things, um, Bung, uh, she's so humble. I, I heard Bung speak not very long ago. She's just amazing. And um, we're just talking about like the next generation and that mindset, right? Where um, you can see it from Jen and you can see it from them from the next generation is the success for the next generation is to be out in the community. And I think that is really going to be the key to the success of any business is to give back. And uh, yeah, but um, I, I notice that right now with the next generation, when I'm dealing with the insurance too is, of course, you know, them being more mindful of protecting the business and being more educated about it. So having an opportunity to be a part of BIPA is amazing because I'm also a business owner and how amazing is it that as a business owner, I could also reach out to these friends of mine, right? For advice and to have that offer to everyone. Um, it's an amazing, and to be able to give back, and that's the key. Thanks, Billy. You can ask your question now. Thank you for being patient. Thank you for doing this today. My name is Janet Brown, and I'm with the Office of Congressman Lou Correa. And my question is federally related. How important is it for people to reach out to the Small Business Administration for their many, many programs? You haven't mentioned a business plan. How important is creating that and using somebody like SCORE, those kind of agencies that are available in the community? Thank you. So uh, I, I find it interesting, and one of the things that we do from a mentorship standpoint is prepare somebody to come in and actually meet with a bank. And, and you know, so there are people who think about, I, I need to go meet with the bank, but they have no idea how to meet for the, with the bank. They have no idea how to be prepared to meet with the bank. And that goes to what you're asking. That goes to what you're asking about, you know, access to the SBA programs. And I think we saw during uh, COVID, you know, when the pandemic hit, I mean, there, was, there were SBA programs out there, the PPP, but... I was hosting Zoom calls with 250 business owners at a time who were asking, how do I navigate the SBA? How do I navigate the PPP? How do I navigate my own bank? Yeah, and so, so again, that starts with, I think we all have an obligation within the banking universe to educate, you know, educate and educate and, and make the system not be such a big mystery. And, and yes, it goes to having yeah, ultimately, transparent financials, you know, be able to apply for a business loan through the SBA, you know, requires a, a, you know, quite a bit of hurdles, quite a bit of work to be able to get your way through that, you know, that accessibility. And, um, but we as a banking system, I think we need to do a lot better to, to educate the, the business owner, the entrepreneur, the startup business, you know, the, the individual, the family, on, on how this all works and how do I have access to it. I, and hello I, to Blue Korea. Yes. 
I suppose uh, a lot of us know, but just for the sake of clarity, uh, SCORE, as I understand it, is a, a non-profit organization comprised of retired professionals, executives, who can advise, who can mentor, who can guide you through the problems that you have, uh, hopefully to have a good solution to the problems. And uh, SBA is a small business administration which doesn't lend you the money, it sort of like guarantees a loan that you make with the bank. So uh, you need to talk to the bankers with respect to getting the SBA loans uh, to fulfill the requirements, both from the SBA and from the banks itself. I just wanted to, um, yeah, please send my our regards to uh, Congressman Luke Correa. I also want to acknowledge Travis Allen. Travis Allen, you're in the crowd? Yes, Travis. Uh, Travis Allen, raise your hand. Yes, I just wanted to acknowledge him. He was our uh, former state assemblyman in the state of California representing all of Little Saigon. So thank you for coming out here to support the event, Travis. Yep, back to you, David. Any questions? Any more questions about the honest? And you, you don't have to ask questions, you can share your experience. Uh, we appreciate all comments. While we're waiting for the next person to come up, uh, let me ask uh, this question to Jen. Uh, earlier on, uh, I believe the last questions, uh, we talked about regulations and education. Now, I understand the supplement products uh, are regulated uh, kind of differently, not state by state, but uh, maybe by the federal government. Uh, how do you promote your products uh, to the audience? Uh, in light of the regulations uh, and the education purpose, uh, do you promote the products just by educating uh, the scientific uh, components of the products, or you mentioned the regulations as well? Yeah, anytime you're ingesting anything, you really want to know what's inside it. And so we really prioritize education in the form of short content. So again, like I shared earlier, we really try to use social media platforms to educate the consumer on what beauty supplements are to begin with. Why do you need to take them? And more importantly, why is our product different from a typical hair, skin, and nail supplement? Um, so we try to educate the consumer by talking about the individual ingredients. Um, how do the individual ingredients help your skin? How does the product as a whole, how does it work when you ingest it? So we really take the opportunity using you know, TikTok or Instagram to educate that way. Um, and for our brand, we take it a step further. We actually work with third-party agencies to perform clinical studies. I think consumers nowadays, I know for myself at least, I want to know what it is I'm ingesting and what the results are. And so within these clinical studies, we'll do a test with anywhere between 30 to 50 participants um, to see after eight weeks of using it, are there any side effects? How is their skin different? And that has really benefited us in regards to marketing. Um, and we haven't implemented this yet, but a program that we wanted to create for the brand, and I really recommend any new skincare brand to do, is partner with um, experts, whether that's dermatologists, nutritionists, doctors, they will be able to add a level of credibility to your brand that you might not be able to and further educate your customers even more. Thank you for uh, educating us about the social platforms. Uh, so your, for your products, you can advertise them on social media and you can like ship the products anywhere. But for a nail salon, uh, does a physical location play a central role in the success of the business? Um, you have any thoughts? I think traditionally having a location in brick and mortar played, played a role in terms of its success. In terms of, uh, you know, they always say location, location, location. So we saw the locations that did well, even within a chain, uh, were the ones that were most successful. Well, that paradigm has sh has changed completely, as mentioned, in, in, in this whole advent of COVID, social media. We have, we have students now, for the first time in our 35-year history, where students are coming in with tens of thousands of followers on social media. And so we literally had a, a, a manicuring student come in who already was doing nail art at home just for fun and just very good at art and using the nail as, as her, her canvas. 
she had such a strong art following that she said, I need to go get licensed now. I need to take this hobby to another level. And so that's our new student. Our new student is coming into Advanced Beauty College with a book of clients and followers as an influencer. And they're going through our, our program, finishing their hundreds of hours, going to get licensed, and then boom, they'll come out to a solo salon suite, they'll go to their own place, and, and they'll go mobile. And it's incredible now that you don't need to be in a brick and mortar location anymore and you can be really mobile and, and done. They've really also Uberized our industry. There are people literally in nail salon, mobile nail salons now. So we're in a day and age where we can get an app, get our manicure, pedicure to us. So our beauty services are coming to us. That certainly happened a lot during COVID. Um, a lot of the regulations in terms of state agencies and what have you are catching up in terms of the mobility of our license. Uh, I got a signal that we should wrap up. So I have this one last question to all of our distinguished panelists. We talked about work. We talked about the things that we should be aware of, things that we should take care of to make our business a success. How do we balance the work and the play, the family life. Let's start with you, Stephen. I'm not a good example of how to do it. Uh, I got a lot of grief in my in my family for not uh, balancing life so well. I think I always I always aspire to do it better than I do it the previous year or previous time. And it, 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 I, I'm just going to say something from the heart, which is you just got to figure out what really matters and prioritize it. And you know, I remember I used to get into the office 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning when I was young and stay till you know, 8 o'clock at night and then go out to dinner with people I worked with and then hang out with them on the weekends. And you know, that was like in my 20s into my early 30s. And, and, and that, that clearly was not the right way to do it. And, and you just, again, you just got to prioritize what really matters. And I think as you get older, and you know, at 59 plus one. Same here. Right, you know, it's, it's been a weird year from a health standpoint, and that really puts a lot of things into perspective. And you know, you just, you just, you just do it. You, know, you just force yourself. And sometimes it just gets easy. You know, when you figure it out, a lot of this stuff just gets easy. Really? Wow. <laughs> Honestly, I live one day at a time. Um, and um, I try not to feel guilty too much because all I know is I'm doing my best to love my family. So when I'm home, they know that I love them. I, I spend a good time with them, but I also incorporate them into my business as well. So when I do these events for families and kids, they're always involved and they're always putting goodie bags together for me. So in a sense, it helps when I get my family involved and very supportive of what I do. Jennifer? I have the luxury of not having children <laughs> or family to have to worry about. Um, so I really admire everyone else on here that has to run a business and has to you know, still make sure that the family, the household is still running as well. Um, I don't have children, I'm already stressed. I just have two cats and that's taking up a lot of work already. <laughs> Um, but for me, I'm a huge um, advocate for work-life flow, not necessarily balance, right? But a flow from your career into your personal life, and that's something that I really prioritize and push for my team as well. For example, um, I myself try to set hours, 9 to 5 with the rest of my team, and I try not to bother them and set have have those boundaries set. Um, I think being the daughter of an immigrant and a single mom, I have seen how much she has sacrificed and how much of her youth she lost, well, not necessarily lost, but gave up for her family and for her business. And I don't want that. <laughs> I want to be able to live my youth um, in a way where I still have a meaningful career, but also have meaningful relationships, friendships, and hobbies that I can pursue. We live in a society where hustle culture is so um, like uh, embedded into everyone. And if you're not doing something, you feel guilty. Even just sitting around watching Netflix, you are you can't sit still. And so that's something that I'm really trying to prioritize within my life and really push for um, the people in my life as well. 
So I really admire your generation. Yeah, it's, uh, I learn a lot from my daughters who are 27 and 30, and, and it's a whole other era. You know, that, that, you know, this balance in life for them is very, although you just threw an interesting plug out there when you said Netflix. My oldest daughter works at Netflix and does all those really cool documentaries, like the murder ones, like Dahmer and all that. That's what I spend my time on. All right, so, um, so she works like 17 hours a day producing this stuff. And uh, you, you, I think you, it depends on where you want to go with your career, how soon you want to make it happen, how driven you are to make it happen, and then you, everything else you map out in that direction. I mean, that kid manages her life on an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> I'd love to connect with her about the true crime documentaries. <laughs> Let's see if I'm done. Uh, I really admire Tan for uh, balancing his life with his, all of his civic involvement and, and a great family. So please share with us. Uh, thank you, I'm Derek. Um, so, so for me, work-life balance, I, I, I've come to the acceptance that it's never in balance. So I actually uh, accepted that. That was number one. Number two, I substituted with another word that worked for me, and it was called harmony, work-life harmony. And, and, and I see th my life in three big circles. I, I see my family life, I see my work life, which is my family business, and then my community life on all these boards that I serve on in the community. And, and I do my best and I'm always very intentional about overlapping these, these as much as possible. It used to be kind of not overlapped in my 20s and 30s. And then as I, as I, got, as I get older, I'm in a family business, I'm in community and I'm on boards that literally their family to me. Like I refer to Stephen as brother. Uh, you know, our president CEO is Jenny Simmons. She's my sister. I'm part of the Cal State Fullerton family. I just traveled to Vietnam, South Korea with them. So Deborah is like the, my sister. And then of course, our dean of business, Sri Sundaram. He's like my aunt. He's my brother. I mean, so we, we, we are family. Obviously in the community, Valeria, you're like my community sister. I'm your, you're like a brother to me. And, and, and so for me, naturally everything's family. It's family first, work second. And when, as, when, when the lines are blurred and I'm able to get these overlapping circles together, I have a lot of harmony. There's weeks where I go hard and I'm working all week and there's no family life that week because I have to go work hard. And then there's gonna be weeks where it's like all family. I'm turning off every board, every work, every job, and it's all about family. So that's just my approach on that. Thank you, thank you for sharing. So I suppose we don't just work hard, we work smart and work from the hearts. Uh, again, I, uh, I would like to thank uh, the panelists, Stephen, Jennifer, Bele, and Tam for allowing me to serve as the moderator to learn from your experience and your insights. Thank you so much.